My name is Konrad Zemek. I'm joined here by my colleague Krzysztof Czepla. We are both employees of ACC, Academic Computer Center, uh, Cyfronet, which is a part of AGH University of Science and Technology in Poland, Krakow. And we are uh, developers, part of the development team of the One Data Platform, which is what the presentation will be on. So a short agenda. Uh, I will first introduce the One Data with its core concepts for those of you unfamiliar with the platform. Then I'll briefly describe the internal architecture, the more interesting parts of it. We'll proceed to the live demo conducted by Krzysztof, which will include multiple parts, like spinning up the instances with example scenarios for distributed access, sharing files between users and data centers, how to use our Fuse client, and how to access and manipulate data through CDMI and REST interfaces. I will then showcase one data in human brain project, how it's used with its image viewer application. Shortly talk about our plans for the near, near future with one data, uh, open data platform in one data. Then there will be a time for a hands-on demo where you, the audience, will log in to one data and share your files with us. Then we'll conclude the presentation with a summary. So, for the introduction. What are the problems that One Data wants to solve? So, the first core problem was that storage technologies are very heterogeneous. We have multiple interfaces for different storages. For example, we have the standard POSIX interface, which you use Linux commands to interface with. And then we may have something like Hadoop FS, which you need to use a special command line tool to use. The storages can be slow, like tape-based uh, archive storage, or very fast, like RAM-backed uh, RAM scratch storages for fast computation. So the first version of OneData aimed to unify the access to those different kinds of data storages by providing a common interface with storage helpers underlying the system that can access all of these different storage types. The very important part of the first version of web data was high throughput processing. So whenever a storage allowed you to use it in a very fast manner, as in parallel storages like Gluster, uh, we wanted to introduce as little overhead as possible. And I will, I will shortly talk about this in a moment, how we achieved that. So when we solved that problem with OneData 1.0, we found ourselves in a unique position where the thing we did make, made sense on a bigger scale. So not only we would unify access to different storages inside a single data center, we would unified access to storages on multiple data centers. So that's how OneData 2.0 began to be developed. For unified data to multiple data centers, we had to implement a high throughput transfer system so that when you access, try to access your data from data center A, but your data actually is stored in data center B, it will be transferred transparently to you and served to you as fast as possible. A big problem that also has to be solved is replica management. And there are multiple parts of this. One is, of course, manual replication, where you tell the system that I want this file to be present on provider A, where provider is a data center, data center A and data center B. But there's also an automated type of replication where uh, the file might be provisioned for you. So when you use your files on data center A and they are physically on data center B, the files are replicated to you. O there's also a type of rec replica management uh, based by policy. So for example, for arch archivization purposes or for uh, data processing purposes. So your, your files may be currently on this slower tape-backed archive storage, but you need it to be on fast 
RAM-based storage. So the policy would detect that you want to do data processing on your data and move your files to this fast storage accessible to your data processing software. Finally, there's a case of sharing. So we, we've seen on previous presentations that sharing data is, is still a problem for the scientific communities. We come up with new ways to share, like open access repositories. So one data enables sharing inside one data via team sharing, where you all have access to a single space, across community data sharing, where various groups of scientists have access to a single data set. And finally, instant, instant ad hoc data sharing, where it works pretty much like Dropbox or Azure or, or any cloud-based file provider would work, where you generate a link to your data and share it through instant messaging, for example. So uh, shortly about the one data team, briefly. Uh, we are currently composed of about 20 people, and the one data team is grouped into developers, which we represent, uh, documentation team, documentation and support team, and testing team. The platform is developed for about, well, more than three years. So during this time, we've released version 1.0 1 and 2.0, in which we greatly increased the scope of the project. And uh, both versions were uh, deployed to Cifronet and Pellegrid resources. We are located in Krakow, Poland. As I mentioned, Cifronet is a part of uh, AGH, AGH University of Science and Technology, which is in Krakow, Poland. And our project is currently supported by Cifronet, Pell Grid, which is uh, an organization that Cifronet is a part of, Indigo Data Cloud, and EGI Engage, under which we develop many features. So what's the big picture of one data? The uh, core element of one data systems are providers. So each of these red circles uh, show us a provider in, a, in the world, one word. A provider may support spaces. Spaces are a logical grouping of users' files, which will be described in a later slide. But what's important here is that multiple providers can support users' files, and not only in a manner where file A resides on provider A and file B resides on provider B, but also where a file is replicated over both of the A and B providers and can be fetched from provider A or provider B whenever it's faster to do so. Mm, right? So the spaces concept. This, the concept of spaces is the most important concept in one data. So as I just mentioned, spaces are logical groupings of files. Spaces can, can belong to multiple users and multiple user groups. And also, spaces can be supported by multiple providers. And just as I said, uh, files, can be, uh, files can be stored on all of the providers or on just one of the providers on, on, or on any subset of providers that support the space. Providers set a quota for each space that won't be uh, that won't be overreached. And uh, so, moving on. Uh, each space exposes a metadata changes feed. The changes feed can be uh, aggregated and used by third party tools. For example, we could set up a Twitter feed that would uh, take, take uh, new changes on a space and publish it to a Twitter account. So we could see that user A just uploaded a new file, user B just changed the file. It's the kind of aggregation that, the, the kind of aggregation and processing that is enabled by this changes feed is important for the 
metadata, creating metadata indexes because that's the only feed that we expose for the space. So when you want to, on the fly, uh, aggregate, aggregate how many files and what type of files one data space has, you will listen to this changes feed and update your metadata as the metadata is updated on the actual one data system. Uh, so for a high level architecture of, a metadata, of one data system, we have one providers, which I mentioned before, one providers are coordinated by one zone. One zone serves to hold uh, user's data like uh, logins or his OpenID Connect providers or his spaces that he belongs to uh, or the groups that he belongs to and of course w what providers support what spaces. The one zone then coordinates uh, coordinates transfers and uh, interaction between providers by uh, authenticating the providers that want to talk with each other and authorizing access by checking whether provider A has access to the space that he wants to access. Then the one provider exposes multiple interfaces which we will discuss in a moment, but the most important for us at this time are the Fuse client which allows you to mount your one data files wherever they are, on whatever data centers they are uh, as in local machine, so we can access them via POSIX interface like you would normal files. And then we have the HTTP GUI, which is very similar to what Dropbox provides, for instance, and REST interface and CDMI interface for manipulating your data and performing certain operations like adding metadata or uh, forcing a replication on our system. Uh, so we've introduced a new concept called one word, where the zones that are, uh, that are coordinating the providers may be deployed in multiple places. We treat zones as a federation level construct, but then zones may talk with each other to provide, to uh, allow providers between zones to communicate and provide data to users so that a user can be locked to one federation and fetch his data from another federation. And uh, zones have to, zones from these different federations have to talk with each other and determine whether the access is possible and how best to perform this access what providers, what nodes of providers to expose to the other zone so that user data can be fetched. For the internal architecture. So the one zone uh, has a GUI for the users. As I mentioned before, the one zone uh, handles users' data. So Provider doesn't really know about the users. Provider knows what spaces he supports. The user logs into one zone. He logs through an SAML protocol, which is currently in preparation, or OpenID Connect. We currently support providers such as Google, Facebook, Dropbox, GitHub, Pelgrid, and the uh, list of providers can be easily extended with new ones. The other interfaces provided by OneZone are REST APIs, and in preparation we have the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting for the open data integration, which I will talk about uh, at the last, in the last part of the presentation. So while the entry GUI is used by users to log in the one data system, the REST APIs, APIs are mostly used by the one provider. So one provider uses the APIs to fetch the data about users logged into the system that currently uses use space supported by the provider. And also it fetches data about spaces that it supports and other providers that supports the, that very spaces uh, to, to facilitate replication of data and communication between providers needed to provide all of users' data to him when he's logged in. The one provider uh, is the actual entity that performs storage access, 
we currently have a variety of storage helpers which uh, interface with the storages. We have a simple POSIX storage helper. We have a Ceph storage implementation. We have S3. And uh, we've just implemented a Swift helper, which we're currently testing. So spaces can be supported by the provider using any of these storage types. So we can, a provider can say that he supports a space with two gigabytes of POSIX storage, of POSIX back storage, where he uh, sets that the POSIX storage is accessed under a certain path in the file system. But he can also say that the space is supported by an S3 back storage, where the credentials are the following. And, uh, and you can on only store, the space can only use four gigabytes of the S3 storage, for example. Next, the one provider itself exposes a variety of uh, interfaces including the POSIX interface, which is actually a binary interface that uh, Fuse client uses to mount data as a POSIX, local, POSIX accessible local data. Uh, we have the HTTP GUI, which is used by users to actually manage his data. Because a user logs in to the one zone to manage his own metadata. The, his login, his email, his providers and spaces. After logging into the system, the user is redirected to a concrete one provider to manage his data. The one provider also exposes a REST and CDMI interface, which I just talked about, and which allow you to manipulate the data and metadata through REST and CDMI protocols. And currently, we have, we are preparing the uh, FTP and SFTP access to your data, and also WebDEV access for easy integration with uh, localhost clients that synchronize data. So, on the last slide, I mentioned that we introduced a concept of, of one word where a zone is a federation level concept and zones, one zones are talking with each other to facilitate data access between the federations. Uh, to this end, we use a Kademila DHT protocol, which is known for its use in BitTorrent. And the DHT here stands for distributed hash table. This is a more involved topic, which I'm not a developer of, so, I can't tell you much about it. Suffice to say that uh, we are implementing a way in which users' data can, users' metadata, like his login or what spaces or and what providers uh, he is supported by, is accessible to all zones, but only authorized zones. So, what's new in One Data Three Zero compared to One Data Two Zero, which we already deployed? So. The One Data 2.0 was an extension of One Data 1.0. So we took the product that was uh, intended to facilitate unified access to different storage types in a single data center, and we distributed it over multiple data centers. What this caused, well, we, uh, we faced many challenges during the development of One Data 2.0, and many problems that were solved uh, inefficiently. So after, after getting One Data 2.0 to a state where we could, we could release it as a final product, we've decided to re-implement One Data 3.0 from scratch using the knowledge that we gained during the implementation of One Data 2.0. So the internal architecture is, and design is built from a scratch to, uh, for easy, integration in a distributed data center scenarios. Our access tokens are now based on macaroons, which uh, allow us for easy, detailed resource level access uh, facilitation and, uh, and read and write permissions and other types of per file permissions. We currently support 
S3, Ceph, and Swift storages, which weren't present in 2.0. The 2.0 uh, only supported POSIX storages. The OneData 3.0 currently provides CDMI, POSIX, and REST interfaces with more on the way, as shown on the previous slide. We have support for zones. Zones are a new concept for OneData, which facilitate federation level, inter-federation access. Uh, our database is now couch-based. Previously, we've used uh, Big Couch, which, which pretty much sees development uh, for some time as they are merging which, with uh, CouchDB. Our system is now fully dockerized, so the live demo that we'll show uh, later uh, will have Docker, uh, Docker containers containing our one data components running on, on virtual machines. So uh, the system can also easily be spun up on a single computer with multiple dockers and you can test this uh, installation on a single machine. Uh, we now feature batch configuration and deployment. So uh, the installation can be hands off if you configure it previously. And we have many, many tests, unit tests, integration tests, acceptance tests, performance tests, stress tests, which does various things and run at various times. So briefly about one data scalability fault tolerance. Uh, so the nodes can be added on the fly to uh, one provider installation by using uh, a GUI or a command line administrative interface. There are two types of nodes, <coughs> manager nodes, which we call cluster manager, and worker nodes. Uh, it is very similar to a master-slave scenario where masters, that is managers, monitor uh, worker nodes and load balance between them, <coughs> and worker nodes perform the tasks given by the tasks that are to do in the system. So all of the tasks are balanced dynamically. Uh, we've separated the components of one data, one provider, the components that I just mentioned. So uh, the worker base and cluster manager base and uh, made them available on GitHub so that anyone who creates a distributed master slave based application in Erlang can use our base for easy load balancing and node monitoring. As I mentioned before, uh, when you have inter data center access, you need to have remote file transfers. So one provider features a remote transfer layer, a subsystem dedicated for transferring files in a parallel manner and utilize, utilizing as much of the network links as possible. That a transfer can be started explicitly by a user in GUI or by APIs, the REST API or CDMI API. The transfers can also be started automatically by a policy which says that data has to be replicated on various providers. Or uh, when the user accesses remote data, so when the user is logged into provider A and accesses data from provider B, uh, this actually uh, triggers a remote transfer which causes a replication <coughs> and also triggers a prefetching event so that when the user continues to read his file, uh, his data will be available to him faster than if he would have to request all of the blocks separately from the other provider. So the transfer is block-based allowing the remote data access on the fly, uh, allowing pre-staging so, pre so that uh, the data is already there on your current provider when you want to use it. Data migration, data replication, which are the use cases I've just covered. One data also supports CDMI with many but not all capabilities of the standard. The most important parts are uh, operations on basic objects. The basic objects in our, um, our use case would be files. Operations on containers, which in our use case would be uh, uh, directories. 
uh, the sitting mirror supported capabilities include uh, manipulating metadata of the files and directories, which are uh, strongly coupled with extended attributes uh, topic for the files. We have options to use uh, access control lists for all, for all the files. The access control lists are based on, uh, you can set up an access control entry uh, per user, per space, per user group. Uh, we have big folders. We can move and copy data objects in containers. We have big files so you can read and write parts of a file. And of course, uh, you can access your files by their IDs in CDMI interface. Uh, 